Okay, thank you for joining us on the first episode of Kicking It with Liam Harrison. And I couldn't think of two better guests than I've got sat with me today. Across here, my coach for the last 21 years, uh, owner of the bad company gym, Richard Smith. And then we've got this homeless looking guy over here. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows my cousin, world champion, Andy Alsen. So thank you for coming on, guys. I want to jump straight in because with you, Richard, because a lot of people have heard me and Andy talking before. I want to go straight to back to the beginning about how you got started in Thai boxing, how Bad Company came around and your martial arts journey. So back to the beginning for, for right. you. Okay, well, that's a long time ago now. <laughs> that's 30 odd years ago. I was um, working, I used to live in Sheffield and was working in Chesterfield. Um, saw an advert for a gym opening. That, so I, I used to do a bit of kickboxing with a friend of mine in his back garden. Um, he used to show me stuff. He had a rock hard punch bag. We used to punch it and kick it till his knuckles bled and... You know, just, just do some silly stuff, yeah. And um, I was on my way back from a, a work, saw this sign for a, a, a gym that was just in a leisure centre. Called in, had a look, liked what I saw. So, so I used to call every day on the way home from work. And um, that was it. I started Thai boxing. Probably been going six months, eight months. Really enjoyed it. Never missed a session. Uh, my coach was a guy called Mike Zamatis. And he um, used to train with Master Toddy in Manchester. It's where he started. And he used to say, you need to get to Toddy's, go to Toddy's. It's really good, it's really good. So I started travelling from Sheffield to Manchester at weekends. Um, and just, again, the bug got me. He, the, my coach got a different job and was away a lot. So I, after about a year, was ended up covering his classes a lot and was teaching a lot. So I ended up going to Manchester more to carry on my training. I'd probably been training two years before I had a fight because there weren't many fights. It was mid eighties. There weren't many events at the time, um, and that was it. Really, just carried on training at Toddy's. Probably spending all my money driving over there three, four times a week to Manchester. Um, I got a job that was that patch um, for a while, so I was there probably five, six times a week, um, and was training there all the time. Then I got another job, moved to Leeds. There was nowhere to train in Leeds at all, apart from a couple of pro boxing gyms that I went to. Um, so I decided I was going to start my own gym. Uh, that was 1991. Um, I was, at, at the time, being very immature, I was reading a comic <laughs> called 2000 AD. Uh, there was a story in that called Bad Company, uh, which I liked, and I liked the idea of it. Um, so I, I called the gym Bad Company, Started on Roundy Road, uh, two nights a week, sports hall. And it just grew and grew. We ended up doing three nights a week. Um, you guys started coming. Yeah, I think we didn't come until about 2000. No, about 2000 we started. Two, so it's still... Yeah, it 2000. Was, yeah. It was already an established, well-known gym when we started as yeah. well. So to get in, that's a short period of time, eight years. Because when we started, there were British champions, Commonwealth champions. Obviously, you were European champion. Lisa were already a European champion. so oh, guys were number one, weren't they? Pitbull were number one. Mm. Well, I, I remember when we started the gym, I, I did a demo. Um, I, I got printed a lot of flyers off and I went around all the shops up and down the street near near where it was on Roundy Road, so loads of shops um, and a lot of the houses off around there. And I put free demonstration, tie boxing, devastating sport, you know, come and watch this spectacular thing, new gym opening and all the rest of it. And on the day I was like, when, it was Sunday morning, I was a bit nervous, I thought nobody's going to turn up, they're just going to see this and rip it up. Um, and actually, it was packed, we put like probably 60 seats out and there were standing room only, there was more more people in there than, um, than, than we'd got room for. Which, yeah. I'm guessing at the time, not many people who even ever heard of Thai boxing before at that time. When no. I first started, I didn't really know where it was. It was Andy who we dragged me clue, down. Did we? So I'm guessing mm. in the early 90s, not many people at all will have even known what Thai boxing was. No, they didn't. Yeah. It was it was it, kickboxing and there was a little bit of like... Uh, John Paul and Van Damme. Yeah, yeah. Stuff, yeah. <laughs> but Muay Thai, you didn't, it wasn't called Muay Thai. Nobody would, would never even dreamt of calling it that. Um so yeah, I, I did this demonstration and I, I'd bo I borrowed a few guys from um, from Dean White, sent a few guys uh, up. He had a gym in Wakefield that was the nearest active gym at the time. He sent his, his, his two 
kids and a couple of the guys who were trained with him. And also, I brought some of the guys up from the Chesterfield gym where I used to teach and train. And we did this demo and um, I said, right, you know, we're starting classes on Tuesday. And I remember saying, it when I did the demo, I said, my, my, my dream, to, the, to all the people, I said, my dream, my goal with this gym would be to one day have a British champion. Um, <laughs> and it was very soon after that that we at the time I was I was fighting it was in the sort of height of my fighting career I'd just started fighting abroad I'd got I was starting with A-class fights I'd been all over the place I'd certainly I'd, I'd, I'd won titles I'd won British titles not won my Commonwealth title yet but <clears throat> um, then Lisa came to the gym and she started training and I'd Three or four guys there was Steve Rutherford, there was Stanley Tudor, there was Steve um, Dean. Steve, Steve, Steve Dean. Dean started a bit later, actually. Oh, yeah. the, the first fighters that we put out for Bad Company were um, myself, Lisa, Stanley Tudor, Steve Rutherford, and another guy who. I'm sorry, Stuart. I can't remember your surname. Stuart. <laughs> Stuart. 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 Call him Stu. Just call him Big Stu. Danger Stu. We'll call him. <laughs> he was ginger, so he was ginger Stuart. Um, and I think we all won. Off, we if we didn't all win, one of us, one of us lost. It was on a guy called Rob Locks show in Stourbridge in um, in near Birmingham, and that was it, really. And then me and Lisa used to just travel around. We used to went. Ev- our, our early relationship was literally going to every single Thai boxing show that there was. We'd sometimes be... It's a right, right deal, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Saturday night, Sunday night, we'd be going to Thai boxing shows and watching. And, you know, me and Lisa were fighting on as many shows as we could. And I, I, pushing the name of Bad Company, just just me and her, I was throwing her in for some right fights within within five fights for, 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 for I say, for me, for the gym. She was fighting, and I got fights for her in Northern Ireland, fighting world champions from America. Come on, Lee, we're off on a date to Northern Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> Get in yeah. there. You've got to fight this Come bird on, first. Bring your shorts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how, I, that's how I actually sort of snared her. Really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used to say to her, oh, we're all going to a show on Saturday night. Do you want to come, love? And she'd, uh, yeah, who's coming? And I'd say, well, Steve and John and blah, blah, blah. Who's coming? Okay, okay. And I'd go pick her up and there'd be nobody else. <laughs> Smooth. <laughs> <laughs> she'd be like, where's everybody else? Oh, uh, they couldn't come. So it's just <laughs> that's me. entrapment, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's false pretense. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that was it. And me and Lisa sort of, Bit of strings and mirrors, really. People by by the time the gym had been going two or three years, people were saying, "Oh, it's a big gym, lots of fighters and all that." And actually, we they weren't. We just it was just the same ones all the time. Yeah, busy, kept busy. How hard was it? Obviously, you just said you were in the height of your career at this point. How hard was it when to start running your, your own gym and having your own fighters and still trying to have your own fight career and fight? Because you're obviously you're at a very good level. And you were fighting some dangerous guys, so how hard was that trying to manage both and do them? Because I saw it when I first started. You were at the back end of your career, and yeah. I saw how much you struggled. Yeah. Most of your training, I ever saw you hitting just the bag. Hit, hitting the bag. Yeah. yeah. So how hard were it when you just first started doing this? It was very difficult. Okay. I, my my training sounds ridiculous, but my training, I, I used to, I was working at the time of a surveyor, so I would go to work. I'd be at work all day. I'd come from work to. I wasn't even the gym, it was to the church hall. And I used to stand there and I used to either go for a run or skip for 20 minutes. Then I used to hit the bag for, you know, five rounds, something like that, do some press-ups, do some sit-ups. And by then, people starting to arrive in for the class. And that was my training. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. And fighting at a decent level as well. I didn't really have anybody to spar with. So I think my entire career has been... Bit of a compromise. The gym only really, I, I say the gym was doing well. It was doing well, but up till early 2000s, when I was fighting, I don't think the gym, well, I wasn't able to put as much time and effort into the gym as I wanted and my fighters as I wanted. So that was always frustrating. And also, I wasn't putting as much time into my fighting as I wanted either. That was frustrating. Yeah, so they're both suffering. So, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So I compromised and it, it, it worked. It was all right. But I think the gym only really took off when I retired from fighting. It was when I retired from fighting, I could then put in the 
time, even though it wasn't enough for my fight career that I, I used in my fight career, I could put that time into you guys. Because I think it was around that time, I probably had three or four fights. I think you'd had about four or five fights, hadn't it, before retiring while we was there. Yeah. I think half the first fight we saw of was his uh, Italian European title. At Ritz's. At Ritz's. Yeah. yeah well, when I, you won that. I probably fought for a couple of years after that, but that, so that was probably... Yeah, but it was hit and miss, wasn't it? Because obviously, like you say, you were busy with the gym and I remember you maybe having one or two fights a year and then yeah. I think it was that, two Takashi fights and the last one in... Uh, blah, 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 blah. Birmingham. Yeah. Birmingham. Yeah, yeah, yeah Birmingham. Don't, don't talk yeah, about we don't, we don't, we don't talk about that. We don't need yeah. to talk about that. But, but that, I, that'll have been it, wouldn't it? So four fights, really, since we were there. Yeah, something like that. I think, I think I'd struggled with an injury mm. and stuff like that. Anyway, there's no excuses. I, I, you know, my career, my fight career and any anything I did there was a brilliant preparation for my coaching and my, my training. You know, I, I learned such a lot from doing it my own way. And I went over to Manchester. I used to train with people. I'd... Um, Guy called Dave Jackson. I used to train with him um, a lot. We used to go over there to spar me and Lisa. Um, towards the end of my career, Mick Mullaney from Sheffield allowed me to go down and train with him because I was down there a lot with work. <clears throat> um, so I've been really lucky. Um, Lisa's brother-in-law at the time, a guy called Eugene, used to train with him. I've been lucky that a lot of people have helped me, coached me, I've drawn things from each one of those guys, um, as well as the stuff I've learned myself. Of course, I was started going to Thailand. My first time I went to Thailand was probably 90, 89, something like that. And I've been there every year of my life, at least once since then. So, you know, started training with GT all the time. Now go to Yod Yut in Kosamui as well, but majority of my training in Thailand has been those two gyms, and obviously learned a lot from being loyal to those guys as well. I always say this to people when they always ask, like, what sets Richard apart as one of the best coaches? I always say that he's fifty years old now, well, around that, and um, but he's still <laughs> and a bit, yeah, and a bit. He, but he's still. <clears throat> goes to Thailand every year and he still trains every day himself when he's there and he still wants to evolve and he still wants to learn and he still sits watching fights and he's still obsessed as a coach and stuff like that. And it, there's not a lot of people who do that. I know a lot of people who might get their own gym up and running, get a few decent fighters and just think, oh, this is all right. I've got enough going on for me. But obviously you've still done that every year. You're still doing it now. You still want to progress yourself even though you've had countless world champions. And that obviously is what sets you apart from the rest, really. Uh, you see, I, I suppose if I looked at it from the outside, it's an ego thing. I've not got a big ego, so I don't mind going and learning, and I don't mind going and accepting that I can still be taught by, you know, after I'm in training now, I'm training with people who are half my age, and they're still coaching me and teaching me because they're, you know, very experienced fighters. Um, there's no issue with that for me because... I think that comes back to the compromising thing that I said before. When I started Thai boxing, because I love Thai boxing, martial arts, I love learning and I love the, the sport. So I've never lost that. And I love going to Thailand or anywhere else where I can just be a student again. I love that. I love getting... It's a break for you, isn't it? Not having to yeah. constantly be... Pad working him, pad working me, matching fights and doing all that stuff. Yeah. I guess it's a break for you, isn't it, as well? Yeah. So I, I love that side of it, and I, I feel like I'm having my my me time and being being selfish again when I can go and train and learn and stuff. And obviously, you know, then obsessively go back home to the hotel or whatever it is where I'm staying and write down what I've just learned and think, ah, that would be good for a class or I can do that in a lesson or whatever. And that's how that's how I've always been, you know. If you had to give one piece of advice to anyone who's just starting out in a gym here, who wants to be a real successful coach, what would that one bit of advice be? What would you tell them? Never stop learning and never think you know it all. That, that's the main thing. The sport, every year when I go back to Thailand, the sport changes and the, the, what the judges are looking at changes a little bit, what the scoring in the stadiums changes. Um the training techniques and the training methods change, not to mention strength and conditioning methods and 
You That's know? only all just come around recently, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. If you think about when me and Andy first started fighting, how much the sport has evolved since then. Like, yeah. Going back it's to what mad, you said, it? it's insane, really. Well, think- the MMA, you know, MMA cut trainings come along. That's a big buzz thing now, into, you know, doing all, doing all your sort of... Um, functional training and then you've got your body weight training and you've got your mobility work and you all that stuff that's all stuff that any coach needs to still be aware of you just, just stay old school and do press ups and sit ups and you know chins on two nails like uh, like, uh, <laughs> like like rocky you know rocky yeah. balboa whatever then that that's that's fine it'll work for some people but at the end of the day you have to find different methods to coach different people and different athletes. So. Even the ties are bringing strength and conditioning in now though as well though, aren't yeah. they? So even they've yeah. got, like, they are as old school as you're going to get. They rarely even, all they want to do is spar, clinch, run, kick the bike, yeah. that's it. Yeah, yeah. But all the top gyms there now, yeah. like uh, Pechin D, Yokao, et cetera, et cetera, they have all even got strength and yeah. conditioning. And until a couple of years ago, I've never even heard of it in Thailand. No, before. it is literally over the last two or three years, isn't it, that mm-hmm. really? But then now you look at the fights in the stadiums now and it, you're seeing much more boxing, you're seeing much more, far more knockouts with hands. Mm. You're seeing the guys using low kicks, stuff like that, which which really for for 10 years, 15 years before, it's just been body kick and clinch. Well, everyone had that stupid concept, didn't they, when we first started as well, Ty Scout Box. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a load of rubbish because yeah. they're all amazing boxes. Yeah. But that was the thing we'd be like, right, fighting a tie, punch his head in. Yeah. <laughs> they can't punch. We'll go spark them, and it don't work. No, but well, now there are now they are. They've all got boxing. Well, look at Pitching D. Have got a boxing coach. Yoko have got a boxing coach. They've all got specific boxing coaches now, which I guess a lot of gyms didn't have then. They're all changing. So even the ties are still evolving with the sport. The ties are really good, like especially the lower <clears> weight guys. Uh, there's, I think it's really sick out. I can't pronounce it. He's got the most WBC title defenses yeah, yeah, more yeah. than Mayweather, so yeah. they are really good boxing level. Yeah. Sirica, Sirica in it. Um, Somrat, gold yeah, medal Somrat. boxing. Yeah, gold medal. Um, Sam he, Hart, he was top Sam level boxer. So, so, Somrat was still yeah. in Olympics when we was at Jay's one year, wasn't it? Yeah. So they are obviously elite level boxers. Like you say, it gets overlooked that. Yeah. Um, but because again, that's how they scored in the stadiums, like. They are going to try and score what's the highest technique. Yeah. But when you do come abroad and stuff, you see them let their hands go more, and you see some of them like with the head movement and stuff like that. And when you're actually boxing sparring them in the gym, you're thinking, right, this is it now. I've been thrown all over in clinch. I'm going to get my own yeah. back here. Revenge. Yeah. And then you just get punched all over. <laughs> Wrong again. As well. Wrong again. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, as a fighter, what were your favourite moment? And. As a coach, what should be your favourite moment? Obviously, your sons are now world champions as well. You've trained your wife to be a world champion. You've created countless world champions. You've got so many to choose from there. What would you say is your best one? You've had, there's a, there's a several questions there. Yeah, um, I know. I got excited, mate. I couldn't help it. <laughs> Answering one word. Just as a fighter and as a coach, what are your best moments? All right. Well, as a, as a fighter, I think... Probably when I won the Commonwealth title, I took the fight on a week's notice. I had to drop, I shouldn't be telling you this, <laughs> 12 kilos. <of> it. <laughs> All right, Joe, Joe Craven. Joe Craven. Joe Craven. <laughs> Craven sat home like, rubbing his hands together. <laughs> Walking about fat and out of shape and I got offered a fight because the guy, the guy called Chris Allen was supposed to be, take, to be doing the fight and he... He got cut in training like a week before. And I, I took the fight. It was in Liverpool. Uh, kickboxing fight it was. It wasn't even more, it wasn't even tie rules. No, we didn't even mention that you used to fight all the different styles. Style yeah, K1, yeah. K1, kickboxing, Muay Thai, yeah. pro boxing. Yeah. You've done it all, haven't you? Well, at the time, uh, when I started the gym, I was managed by a guy called Paul Hennessy, who's now Show Sport International. It, he had... Fingers in lots of pies. The WKA was big then, and a lot. Most of the gyms were involved in the WKA. And it, he used to call me. So I've got a fight for you. I go right, okay. When he said the tenth of June, or whatever. I said, I'll take it. I'm fine for that. And he go, I haven't even told you what rules it is yet. Yeah, I'm not bothered. Go on, I'm fine. Whatever. And sometimes it'll be long pants, kicks over the waist. Sometimes it will be just boxing. Sometimes it will be Muay Thai or 
Low kick rules. Low kicks, yeah. whatever, yeah. Um, and when I first moved to Leeds, because there wasn't um, any Thai boxing, I got a pro boxing licence because I was going to a pro gym and had a few pro boxing fights as well. So, you know, I did a bit of everything, which again helped me with my coaching, mm. um, helped me with my fight career as well. I had some great experiences, travelled abroad, did a lot of travelling. So, yeah, my, probably my greatest moment was winning that fight because I took it on a week's notice and, you know... That Phil... Phil, Phil Barton, Yeah, yeah, good fight, yeah. that. It was a real good fight yeah. somewhere on YouTube. It's on YouTube, that one. It is on YouTube, yeah. yeah. Me and Silly, silly Moon Boots. But <laughs> other than that, it was good. So that, that was a good moment. You know, lots of trips abroad, lots of stuff. Great experiences like that. Um, greatest moment as a coach, I can't, honestly, I, I cannot... I couldn't even give you a top 10 because I've had so many amazing ones from Lisa winning her first title. She she was my first homegrown, if you like, world champion, somebody who came to my gym with no experience. No experience that you trained from scratch. And I trained yeah, her yeah. to become a world champion. Uh, so obviously there's also the fact that we were, you know, we weren't married at the time, but we were in a relationship. Canoodling. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Touching her up behind beaches. <laughs> so there's that, there's, you know, there's you winning. I, I remember when the when you won that, you won that, I think that was kickboxing, world, that world yeah, title. in Italy. In, in Italy, in Naples. <laughs> and messed us about something cruel to change oh, that the was scales. Ridiculous. Change scales. <laughs> well, I, got, I, I weighed him at 62. It was a world title at 62.2. I weighed him bang on. I, I remember yeah. flying there because we took that late notice. We only took it on two weeks' yeah. notice, didn't yeah. they? Again, that was yeah. Paul Annecy. We just mentioned, he rang you up and said, Right, I'm only about 19. So, world title in Italy. Do you want to do it? I went, yeah, obviously. <laughs> got there, weighed him bang on. Went away. I said, oh, where's my opponent? I said, oh, he'll be here in an hour. He's running We'd had a free course meal and all sorts by the time he turned yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Steak, pasta, two litres of water, loads of Coca-Cola, which you shouldn't really be drinking after you've weighed in, but I did it anyway. <laughs> I'd eaten loads of dessert and everything because food in Italy is just amazing and I couldn't say no to it. And then when he turned up, he was 64 kilo. I said, well, no. Where are the scales? I weighed in him for a start. They went, oh, you broke them. What do you mean I'm broken? Yeah, I was like, well, you better tell him to go lose weight. It's a world title. In a world title fight, you have to be on weight, and that's that. But then you weighed yourself on those scales. Well, didn't they you? said to me first, went, oh, we can't lose weight because uh, TV's over there. It looked bad for Italian TV. I said, I don't give a shit what it looks bad for. I said, get him outside <laughs> yeah. running now. And they went, no, you get back on scales. I went, all right then. And after two litres of water, a free course meal, a probably a big litre bottle of Coca-Cola and all the rest of it, and only put on a kilo, kilo and a half. kilo and a half on it. Yeah, yeah, you were still under, weren't you? Yeah, and yeah. I said, it went on, they went, oh, look, you're nearly the same weight now. And I just got so mad, I just went, forget it. Yeah. It don't, I don't even care. <laughs> and then I, when they punched me in the face, next day I realised what a mistake that was. <laughs> I, remember, I remember coming back to the corner and at the first round, I went, God damn. I went, fucking hell. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and you yeah. went, what, what's wrong with me? I went, no. <laughs> well, I remember that fight particularly because the guy came out at you and he did he did knock you about for a round or two early on, mm. and you know it was it was oh yeah, it's going to be a hard fight this, and he was bigger than you, and he obviously got the home crowd and everything else, but the, you kept chipping away, chip 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 chip, and then I think it was about round four, round or four, wasn't something it? like that. Suddenly, his entire demeanour changed. You, you, you <laughs> hit him with a low kick, and he just went. Oh, oh God. <laughs> and I was like, yes, 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 yes. And then you did it a couple more times and it went down. It was like a real, like, you turned the fight round. So that that was a good moment. There's, there's Obviously, there's lots of times when... <laughs> Silly bollocks have done something ridiculous over there. House when House has been on floor and got up, like, right. <laughs> Split his face wide open and then gone on to win. There's, 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 there's some, been some crazy moments all the way through. So I, honestly, I can't say which has been my favourite moment. My favourite moment when Jordan Watson met that person we won't name shit yourself. At, like, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know you were going to shoehorn that moment. I've been waiting for that. <laughs> well, I we were about in gym over there and I thought, yes, this needs to be mentioned because this has somehow gone unheard It's gone of. under radar yeah. for a long time, and it is. It's time to bring it back. And now there's no axe kickboxing <laughs> anymore. It's been let go. Well, I'll let Richard just tell the story of what happened. <laughs> well, it was it was our show. It was our show. It was um, at the Royal Armouries, and it was Ramon Decker's brought 
a team of we brought we brought Deckers over. It did a seminar on the morning, on the Saturday morning, and we had loads of coaches came and did the seminar with him, and then we'd put the show on in the evening at, at the Royal Armouries, and it was bad company versus Team Deckers. So it was a team of my fighters against. Um, so there was there was you, there was Liam, there was. Richard, Richard Cadden. Richard Cadden won it. I think. And Steve Rutherford. Steve Rutherford, Rutherford yeah. yeah. And you uh, fought an Irish I boy. fought Irish and Jordan fought... <laughs> oh, there oh, he is. Oh, he's, he's, he's done it. He's, he's, he's dropped him. <laughs> that, that lad from... <laughs> <laughs> so we, um, we had the show. It was a really successful show. It was sold out. We are turning people away at the door because we had a limit to how many we were allowed in. It was mental, that, because Armouries is not a small place no. either. It's yeah, a big old place. Really, no, it was, it was a real good concept to yeah. do that for as a show, you know, because Ramon Deckers at the time was massive and, you know, bringing him over and bringing his fighters over and putting them against our, our team was a really, you know, brilliant concept. That was Paul Hennessy again. That was show sport who came up with that idea <clears throat> and he had the relationship with Deckers. Anyway, I'm diversing from... <laughs> yeah. Get back the, to the shit, stay in the <laughs> subject. <laughs> so, uh, it, Jordan was fighting, and uh, I think it was round two, the bell went, and he came back to the corner. And I knelt down at his feet to, to talk to him, and I was giving him coaching advice and everything else. I, I smelled something, I looked at him. Like, <laughs> you smell shit? I smell, I smell shit! shit. <laughs> <laughs> Jordan, have you shit yourself? And he went, no. And I went, oh, somebody has. Oh, it was a really <laughs> bad smell. So I turned around to look in the ring and there on the floor of the ring was lots of little walnut whip, bits of particles of <laughs> Little Maltesers rolling around. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> so I said, ref, ref, ref. I said, somebody's, and I pointed it. Oh, dear. Right, somebody needs to clean it up. So... <laughs> Somebody, it's your show, man. <laughs> it's your show. It's your fighter. The show must go on. Come on. So I used the towel that, that we'd got in the corner with us. Went in there, wiped all this. Poop. I were on next fight. I hope you didn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, were it you than me? What on it? Yeah. Wiped all this poop off the ring canvas, and then obviously afterwards I went over to um, Paul Hamilton, who, who was fighting. It was I said. Has he just shit himself? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> so to this day, no one's actually admitted. Well, you can see on the DVD. You can the, see it flop looking, out of him. He's looking behind him. <laughs> looking down his legs. So we all know he did. And because Jordan kept teeping him right yeah. hard as well. I think he must have gone in the he fight with a bad stomach. Yeah, I think he did like four in a row, didn't he, Jordan? Or something. He went front leg, yeah, back yeah, leg, yeah. front leg, back leg. Then he just <laughs> fell out. Yeah, yeah. Horrible. So yeah. obviously the show, the fight was delayed while we, while we cleaned the ring <laughs> canvas. Use some of my. I don't think we even had any disinfectant spray or anything at the time. It was, Spat on it and rubbed yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. I got it. I went next fight and I got it ring and I got on my knees to do my ramu and I looked on the floor and I thought, is that Something blood or stinks, shit? And I just thought, <laughs> oh, you know what? I'm not even stand doing that. Oh, right, let's fight. I'm not well, even doing that. Jordan, <laughs> th- Jordan had borrowed Andy's anklets, hadn't yeah. he? And shorts. <laughs> he had my anklets on, my shorts on. He rang me up morning and went, got any shorts? I haven't brought out. Oh, fuck's sake. Yeah. Turned up, give him them. He came to the gym two, three days after the show, give me my shorts and anklets back. And anklets were all rolled up. When I unrolled them, shit just flicked everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I just looked at them and put them straight in bin. I'm, like, I'm sorry, if I were fighting someone and I knew they'd shit themselves, I'd say to the ref, you better give me, I have one disqualification. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. fighting him when he's shitting the whole down Clinching his leg. Him. <laughs> no, the, the, fight, the fight finished, It was because it was halfway through, like, I don't know. It was a good it fight, through. to be fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah Really yeah, good fight. Around, I think it was around four when it happened anyway. I want to end around three or early something around four, like something like that. So we nearly I'd, finished. I'd have to watch it. I've got it on DVD somewhere. I'd have to watch it. But yeah. yeah. That was a really good show, actually, that we're on about that because Deckers did bring his team over and I think me, Steve and Cadden... All wins. Yeah, we're all yeah. wins. We, we, yeah, we, yeah. It was a bad company, three or four, and Team Deckers nil. Yeah. And obviously, he was not very happy at the end of it. And, you know, it's one of the things that, you know, cements the the reputation of the gym and pushes us up there. It was, it was good, yeah. yeah there's I'll, not many people that can go like that, can they, as well, and say, we had t- we had Roman Deckers over and our team levered his, basically. <laughs> it's yeah, a good exactly. thing to have in, on like the gym. Them shows, though, it? like the, the armories and especially the town hall shows, town hall shows I think amazing. every time we put a show on there, all our fighters fall out of their skin. Yeah. They were always like... I literally have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, <laughs> it's true. Yeah. You have seen you, know, you get some horrific injuries there and somehow still Town, win. I know. Oh, that time you broke your neck and you lost. No, apart from that, <laughs> I won. I won on DQ. Oh, <laughs> but yeah, them old school uh, town hall shows, everyone still messages me about them t- to this day, yeah. saying they were some of the, the best ones they'd ever seen and stuff. Uh, what? Which one did, would you say were your favourite one of them? Because you fought on one of them yourself against Takashi, and that was the first ever one I saw at the town hall. Yeah, that was the first and one that, we went to. That's still my one of my favourite fights is the, the Takashi one. Um, but we've had some amazing ones, like Andy when his lip fell off against the uh, Malaysian. <laughs> Malaysian. Me versus Nampom were a yeah. good fight. We've had yeah. some amazing shows there. It's another one I'm going to sit on the fence and say genuinely. Lisa beating Alonka. Matt Lisa Lauren, beating Alonka, really, yeah. 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 Well, that, that's one of my greatest moments of my, my fight career because Lisa had been over to Rotterdam and fought against Alonka. They'd, they'd set it up so that Lisa lost. Um, messed us about, you know, she wasn't going to win the fight. Did her arm go as well? In one. Her arm went, she hurt her, she hurt her arm. The, 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 it was just one of those where she was never going to win because we were in their backyard. And we wanted a rematch and brought her back over to fight on Leeds Town Hall. They came over really arrogant, really cocky. You know, Elonka thought she was going to batter Lisa. There was no... She struggled to make weight, didn't she? Long yeah. as well, didn't come in professionally. Yeah, yeah, she was heavy. Right. Yeah, they argued that. And we remember that day well. <laughs> <laughs> and Lisa destroyed her when they fought. Oh, oh he murdered her. Yeah, You're right. Her. Clinching. Yeah, yeah. Need it, was, it, it was really good. So yeah, that was a good moment. There was there was the one when didn't you both fight Malaysians? The Japanese, we Japanese, both Japanese. Yeah, that that, that was, they were that, amazing. That fans. was when yeah. I won my first world title. That one, yeah. I won yeah. Ice and Liam destroyed that poor guy. The, like, yeah. um, just, just a Terminator. <laughs> one, he was rock hard. But there's even. Do you remember the one where we um, were supposed to be bringing the Thai team over? Oh, and it all fell apart. And and all French, fell apart. French, yeah, yeah, French came instead. With, how you did that on like 48 hours notice? Yeah. Because they yeah. were strong guys who we yeah. brought as yeah. well. Yeah. He fought... Um, Sebastian Akana. No, Vera Che. Oh, Vera Vera Albert, Chay, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. Albert Che. Albert Che, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I fought Mikel Lallemand. Mikel, yeah. And, and Karen fought Rung. And they still somehow ended up still being an incredible show. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we're really good on that. I remember what, what happened was it with... The, the tie who was bringing the team over, I kept messaging him and ringing him and saying, have you got your visas? Yeah, the visas. No, no, no problem, no problem. And I was, yeah, you need to go get your visas. You can't, you can't just get your visas on the day and then come. Visas, you know, you've got to get visas for these fighters. Yeah, no problem, no problem. And then it came to like the Monday and the show was on the Saturday and he still got no visas. It's okay, I go today, I go today. So he went and, oh, they closed, got to go back tomorrow. Went back tomorrow, they tell me I have to come back Wednesday. You know, Wednesday came and went, no visas. And eventually Thursday, which was obviously the day of day the... Day before f- weigh-in, wasn't it? Day of the, the flights. Sorry, we're not coming, we can't come. So I've got Leeds Town all booked, all the publicity, all the train, fighters trained, all everything, all the money we'd spent, everything else. People have bought tickets to see Bad Company versus... Thailand and they were a strong Thai, Thai team it was probably, probably, a good, that, probably a good job fair, yeah. Yeah. to be fair it's yeah, a yeah. very good job <laughs> Captain Kane Manasak yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we uh, so on the Thursday night we had no no lost three the three main events of the show but again Paul Hennessy with his contacts and um, it's um, uh, Hajj Hajj yeah, better it was Hajj from, wasn't it yeah um, yeah from France we called him and said, we have a problem. Said, okay, no problem, no problem. And he sorted it out. And by by Friday morning, we'd got three very good level French mm-hmm. fighters. Um, booked the free, booked the flights, everything was sorted out. And it was really before social media was particularly big. So, like, if that happened now, you'd put on Facebook, there's been a big change to the card, this is the card. Anybody who doesn't want to come, you know, mm-hmm. we can refund your tickets, but... Hopefully everybody wants to still wants to come, but we, we couldn't do that. So we literally put a handwritten sign up in the entrance to Leeds Town Hall <laughs> saying, there's been a big change. The ties can't come. If you've come to see the ties and you don't want to see the show, we see us and we'll give, you a re- we'll give you a refund. Um, but this is the card as it is now. And we didn't ask, get asked for one refund. It, it, you know, everybody came. It was a brilliant show. And went really well. That, that was one of those that, 
you know, taught me a lesson that it's not all over till it's over. You know, you, you never give up because and nothing's too big a problem. You can always sort something out. Talking about um, <coughs> shows and social media and stuff, then you just reminded me, I wanted to bring this up, about how shows used to be back in the day when we first started. Because again, we were on about this earlier. When we first started in years, you end up having to like make your way up as young fighters and stuff. And you just, like you said, and this is, I think, some fighters don't do enough today. They don't Not just get all. in there and fight. You've got like young up and coming fighters who are having like three fights a year. When we were younger, when you first started putting us out, we were fighting 10 times a year. Yeah, yeah. Just to get us in there against any opponent, just to get the experience that you need. So when you do start to fight at A class level against ties who have had hundreds of fights, you've got. It's never going to reach their level of experience, but you've still got enough about you to be able to match it with them, which is how, where I think a lot of fighters struggle today. They don't just get in there and fight. Like when I first started, you'd come up to me maybe on a Wednesday, say, Liam, come here. You're fighting on a Saturday. Who against? do not matter. Not from this gym. Yeah, not, that was right. it. That, that were it. There were no more questions. I couldn't go looking on going yeah, on YouTube. No YouTube, finding couldn't, out couldn't what they're get, doing. get scared. Just get in there and you fight. And I think social media and stuff like that, although it's a godsend to a fighter, yeah. to like an up-and-coming fighter who's got a bit of nerves and stuff like that, it's a curse. Because there's so many people now, you know how hard it is now, all three of us have promoted shows. When I say, look, I've got this guy here, will your guy fight him? Let me just have a look on me on social yeah. media. Look at He's my last show. Strong. My lad can't yeah, fight him. Yeah, yeah. Why they've had the same amount of fights? Yeah. He's had three wins. Your lad's had two. It's there. Oh, no, can't fight him. So I've stuff seen like him that. Train, yeah. When, like, like we just said, we were having 10 fights a year just to get in there, get the experience. By the time you get to like 18, 19, you've had 40, 50 fights. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's just the curse of social media this day, as well as being a, like a, a gift you can get yourself yeah. on, you can do stuff like that. It's always also... I agree. There's, to be fair, there's more pressure on kids and fighters now than there was in that respect because, you know, you can have three fights and then you've got your own Facebook page all of a sudden, you know. Um, you got Joe Blog's Fighter, that's your Facebook page, and then you want to get people to like it and all that. And you can go out there and you can publicise yourself and promote yourself, but then as soon as you're doing that... Every fight's a big deal, and every any time you lose, it's a bigger deal than it, it would have been. So, it, it, as you say, it's a curse, and fighters have to fight within that now. If they want to, if they want to make this name and want to get big, they have to join that that bandwagon. They have to get Facebook pages and go on YouTube and have publish what they're doing all the time, and promote themselves, and have Instagram and get as many followers as they can, and all the rest of it. And they the 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 fighting and training within that pressure. Whereas when you guys, and certainly when I was learning, it was just nobody knew, nobody had heard of it, nobody just went off and had fights here and there and a couple of fights abroad and no one really knew. And You only so, knew because you'd seen them actively yeah, fight yourself or yeah. something. Yeah. So while you can dismiss what kids nowadays, oh, they don't know, they're born, you know, we used to after this and that and we used to do that. I do think the pressures are still there. It's, it's not as easy in a lot of ways for kids nowadays. And actually, again, being dismissive of kids and saying, well, oh, you know, they don't know the bone, they're not as hard as we were. We used to fight and didn't know we were fighting and stuff. The look at the level now. You go to one of Pete Spensley's junior shows or if I'm a... They've all got better technique than me then. The, there's some... Yeah, the Ten-year-olds are better than me. <laughs> yeah. They're all is. There's some absolutely brilliant kids and some of the fights that you see now are, you know, a level above anything that, that with all due respect... But in your no, it is. No, it is. Right. Well, look at Lewis. Look at Lewis and Finlay first fight. Yeah. That were unbelievable. Yeah, that, one of the best junior fights I've ever best seen. Best junior fight I've yeah. ever seen yeah. that. It was just outstanding and we were just stood in corner. Like, we couldn't even really cheer. We were just like, wow, this is yeah, yeah, amazing. amazing. This. Wow. <laughs> like my first 10 fights, I don't think I threw a kick until about fight eight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Say, my first fight, we took it in 30 second intervals to punch each other. <laughs> I didn't throw a kick. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, like I say, it's easy for. You know, us old farts to all dismiss it. Now, oh, nowadays kids don't know they're born. You know, all nowadays they all want to have their own personal trainer and their own strength coach and their own this and they've got their own Facebook page and they haven't. They don't deserve it. We didn't used to. But they, you know, if you if you want to succeed now, you have to do that. And you know, kids can't be blamed for the 
the system that they're born into. And, you know, the the, the level has grown. I, I, I still don't think, with all due respect, there's anyone out there who will come along and take your two crowns yet. Um, but, you know, the, the general level up to that is, is certainly higher than it ever used to be. Yeah, massively, because, like, back then, it wasn't heard of. There were only a certain few of us who were <coughs> fighting, like, the ties. Back then, like, me, Andy, had fight um, the odd other person here and there, Peter Crook, people like that. But now we've got, like, McGowan, we've got Agate, we've got Liam Nolan, we've got, like, names coming off all over, Panacos, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So sorry for missing people out, they'll get offended. Yeah, yeah. But there's that many now that I can't even name them who are fighting all against the top ties. But like when you think about back then, which is what I'm gonna say, like the big shows for the juniors now, what like Spensley does with the Yokau juniors and stuff like that, and what Brian did with the Yokau shows, they've got like a really good stage to fight on. They've got a proper entrance. They've got a big crowd. Back then, we were fighting in smoky working men's. Yeah. I wanna say, remember that show Wait, when Paul Hamilton show. The strippers when, were. I was 15 years old. <laughs> and it was my second or third pro fight. So there were a fight. A magic and a magician, yeah, a the fight, yeah. and then something else, and then something else after that. I was getting ready to warm up. I looked out, ring, the strippers on with the tits out. Yeah. Thought, this is the best thing I've <laughs> ever seen. I'm only 15, yeah. but this is, I thought, what a sport I'm in here. They got, they got, they got this great guy out covered in, covered him in, covered him in cream. Alan, 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 Alan Reed, not Alan Reed, what were his name? Alex Reed. Alex Reed. Alex Reed. Alex Reed. Cabin for one yeah, 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 Alex yeah. Reed. And then, mental, <laughs> mental guy. They had him naked in ring, licking cream <laughs> off like, you know, like every orifice and stuff, shoving things in him and all sorts. <laughs> and I was like, so I've watching, we'll have to get me in there. We'll to get <laughs> yes, me in there. Get him in. <laughs> but I honestly, that's how it was, wasn't it? Back then, you're fighting at a smoky working men's club, and yeah. that's just what you yeah. had to do. And yeah, stuff. it was getting changed under the stairs and yeah. all sorts. Yeah. Of that was the worst thing, though, wasn't it? That people were literally sat there ringside. The judge might be sat there smoking. It were horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't, <laughs> breathe, <laughs> couldn't breathe up there, could you? Yeah. But yeah, you made the ring was, as well. It was you like forget how bad it mate. was. It and was then so bad. I was watching a video of um, one of my older fights that my dad found of a week, and you can literally. <laughs> Just see, see all the smoke, smoke guy, yeah. Yeah. and you forget how bad it actually yeah. was. Took four years off my life that fight. <laughs> <laughs> what, as a coach, Richard? Obviously, you have achieved so much now. What goals do you still have as a coach and for Bad Company? And where do you see it going? Um, my really, <laughs> oh, you've done him there. Look, yeah. you've done him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to say. And make myself sound sort of arrogant, really. I, the gym's obviously a, a successful gym. We're high up there. We've got lots of titles. We're, lots of, we're a well-known gym. You know, Bad Company is, is, is a name. And I suppose, really, I want to keep it there. You know, I don't want the gym to... Slide, become, anyway. Yeah, yeah, slide. And, you know, at the end of the day, <clears throat> all due respect, you've not got so many more years left in you. Andy, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, son. He retired 18 yeah. times. Yeah. Sorry, got another five left in him at least. I'm going to legs for me. <laughs> but obviously, you know, give, give it two or three years and you guys might be looking at retiring, whatever. You know, I wouldn't want people to say, well, Bad Company were just a one-trick pony. No, now those, those guys have gone. They're nothing. They're not nothing, but they're, they're not as big as they were. So obviously we're still bringing fighters through. We've still got you know, some good guys coming through, you know, we've got, you know, Joe Craven, we've got Matthews, we've got um, people at that level fighting, um, as well as um, the kids and the juniors that are coming through, you know. We've you probably got one of the strongest junior yeah. teams in country, right? if not the strongest. Yeah. If you look yeah. at Finlay, Fergus, Mark, uh, Lewis, Lewis. Jones, um, all those guys, Give them two or three years. It was seventeen, eighteen years well, old. Yeah, see, Finley's going to be fighting A class in the next two years, isn't he? Yeah. So you yeah. know. So yeah, that, that's my 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 goal because a goal means you there's an end to it, doesn't it? You know, goals like you got there and that's it. I just want to keep the gym up there. I want to keep the gym successful. Um, I want to carry on enjoying what I do because I'm still as obsessed with it and I still love it as much as I, I ever did. You know, it, it's my life it's my family's life you know there's lisa there's the kids there's you know everything so i just want to keep enjoying what i'm doing and 
keep it where it is. Did you ever see, obviously, Finley and Fergus, they were in the gym a lot when they were growing up. Did you ever see them both becoming world champion? Did you ever vision that? No, not really. I, I think I overcomplicate it, you know, it's like holding my sons and I don't want them thinking them pressuring them too much you don't have to do it to make me proud of you you don't have to do it to make me accept you so I might have possibly not pushed them as much as the Lisa pushes them a lot I was going to say them. Lisa pushes them more than you yeah, she <laughs> she's like Fergus get here now yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hands him all over the place slaps him about I said if you want to do it we'll push you but you don't have to you know so it, it comes from them they want to do it I'm really proud of how they both are. They both approach their training in different ways. And Fergus swept hand <laughs> the other day. Yeah, yeah. Fergus swept the other day. I was gutted. <laughs> <laughs> a legitimate sweep as well. It wasn't even like he caught my leg and I fell over. He caught my leg and booted me on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Well, that extra inch he's grown in lockdown did him a favour. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's been trying to do it to me as well. I, 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 he nearly I, got me yesterday yeah, as well. Yeah. But yeah, you know, obviously I'm really proud of them both. It's not... It, it, it clearly means that I'm more likely to carry on with the gym for a longer period and carry on loving what I do for a Because you haven't got a choice anymore because yeah, they're cause, still fighting. Because <laughs> they're there and the lads want to do it and, and all that. So it's, it's it's easier. If if I had three kids who didn't want to come to the gym and weren't interested in the sport, it'd be pulling me away. It'd be a lot harder for me yeah, to, yeah. you know, if, if, if Lisa wasn't interested in the sport as well, you know, you, you look how many Thai boxing coaches you know split up and divorced because you know the lifestyle of running a gym like like ours you're away every here and there at weekends every weekend isn't fighters. it like, sometimes you're away yeah. Friday with someone to fight Saturday then yeah. back for another show on Sunday yeah. somewhere else yeah, so you're out, you're out all weekend you ran your gym I, 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 were I was never in the house Kirsty hated me mm. more than she does <laughs> 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 I was never in the house because I'd, because I'd, um, I'd, for me, the same thing because I was brand new and obviously a lot of people were expecting the gym to do well straight away because of because of my name and I was well I might be a crap coach for all I know no one knows luckily I was all right you know I had really good kids um, but I could because I wanted to get them all out and I had so many fighters I had like forty odd fighters with the kids and the adult team I was out uh, away in Friday. A fight Saturday, another Sat Sunday. I was out all weekend, literally every weekend on the trot for months and months on end. I didn't have any weekends off. It's insane. I think that's again, like you were saying there, that people expected, just expected it from you. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a thing that gets massively overlooked. That not every good fighter is going to be a good coach. No, it's a completely different thing being able to coach someone and guide them and mold them into a good fighter than it is than you just doing it yourself. Um, what do you think are some of the biggest differences there and what are some of the things that you need to do to separate the two and become good at both or um, progress in one or the other? I think for me, the one thing that I took away from how Richard coaches is not one style. There's a lot of gyms and a lot of coaches that are one specific style. Yeah, you can see some gyms where you'll every fighter will look the same. Yeah, and you know when you're fighting them are go clinch them, they can't clinch, or go boot the leg, they never block. And yeah. you know, a lot of things, like, and our gym is not like that because of Richard. Yeah. When you look um, at all our top level fighters, every one of them's had a Ross, different style yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah. From that, Lisa to me, to Cadden, to Jordan, to Andy, yeah. to David Mack, everyone were totally... To, to Badger, we're all to different. Badger, completely all totally different. different. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's what I said about keeping yourself learning because you, you, if you've only got one way of doing things, that's all your fighters will ever do. That's it. Whereas I, I think you need to keep learning and keep improving and keep keep learning stuff you're trying to do trying stuff out yourself uh, and that gives you more options to do with your fighters 100 percent. yeah and i think that goes to the styles as well like we've like i'm saying some people only teach a specific style you know a tall fighter who's a coach might only be able to teach how he fights which obviously like if I'm if if you're six foot three and you're teaching that to someone my I height wish I was six foot three. it's not gonna work you don't you love being, you love being a midget <laughs> But it wouldn't work, would it? You know what I mean? Like, we ca we can't do things that tall people like Dean James can do, for yeah. example. You know what I mean? We can't do that. And you have to take that into your coaching as well. So if you're teaching a tall fight, you've got to, you've got to adapt your coaching to who you're actually coaching with. You can't just go, well, it's my style, so you're doing that. 
that's been a bit arrogant with it. You, you've got to adapt to who you're training with. I think with. that comes back again, what Richard mentioned earlier about just letting ego go on. And so yeah, you have yeah, to do that definitely. as a coach and a fighter as well. <laughs> Anyone who has ego in Thai boxing, really, they're just prepping themselves to fail, I yeah. think. Yeah, Classically. 100%. 100%. You, my, my advice to anybody would be get your fighting career out of the way first. Do what you think you need to, you, you feel that you need to do with your fighting before you start coaching because you can't do both. I tried it and, you know, obviously I am where I am so I can't moan about it. But Yep. It, Thing is though, I was just going to say that earlier when you was going on. I never knew that you coached before you even opened Bad Company, did you? I never knew no, that you ended really. up coaching the gym you went to actually learn at. Yeah, I ended, so up, I, I in, ended up teaching. Yeah. yeah. So basically for your entire f- career from learning to do anything to now being up there as like one of the best coaches in the world and with our gym, you've you've always trained and fought simultaneously. Oh, was I, I, I'd, only, I'd only been there, the gym in Chesterfield, Chesterfield Cobra as it was, for about a year when my, my coach got a new job and he spoke to me and he said, look, I'm not going to be able to get back very often now. I need you to start taking the, the classes. He said, I'll give you PTs. Um, he had a... He had a Jim in his basement. I'll give you PTs when I'm when I can to, to make up for it. But unless you start taking the classes, I'm not going to be able to um, carry on the gym. So I said, "Well, obviously." What year were this in then? Eighty eighteen sixty two. Well, if you think about it, <laughs> that is a lot of trial and error and stuff that you've had as a coach over the yeah, years. Yeah, and yeah, imagine yeah. getting through. I couldn't imagine after a training for a year, someone saying, "Right, you're up. Teach yeah. this class. Crack on, lad." I'd been straight out fighting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And it was. I mean, obviously, what I felt I needed to do was get up myself over to Manchester, to learn as much as I could, learn stuff. But but all of a sudden, what I was doing when I was training was not just looking at what would work for me as a fighter. I was looking for things I can teach that and I can teach that and I can do that in a class. So I was wanting to learn stuff for for a different reason to what maybe you as a, a fighter, fighter would, you, be, would yeah, be. Yeah, you yeah. Know. So I would I would I would be trying to learn stuff that I not wouldn't necessarily ever use in a fight just so I could coach teach it to someone else. Yeah. Yeah. Did you say as well? I remember you saying earlier as well that you was working all the time as well. Yeah. So you had a full-time job all the time, surveying, yeah. as well as coaching someone else. No wonder you couldn't freaking train for a fight. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, no yeah. wonder every time we came in, you were punching back. Yeah, I'm yeah, like, what's yeah, he yeah. doing? He fights tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, I did my best with what I'd got. and Yeah, again, but you still I, reached the good... Like, Takashi were no mug. Yeah. Takashi was sick in that fight with Takashi. Yeah. He still won the best fight. Well, you saw British Commonwealth, in. European, and uh, you fought for... Four or five world titles against like the top guys at the time. Yeah. Think, yeah. Winston well, and everyone. Yeah. You thought, should have had that world title at Town Hall. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I fought, well, I fought five times I fought for world titles and then at the best I got was a draw. That was that fight against Takashi Ono. Lisa can't watch that fight. I can't watch it. You got robbed. It <laughs> so that should have been your moment and all that. But, you know, even that, I don't think there's any point getting bitter about it. It got me where I am. It helped me towards, you know, everything I did, good and bad. It gave us the Takashi body shot in gym, didn't it? Yeah, that's yeah, what it yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, we, all, exactly. we all started using that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, guys, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, just before I go, do you want to tell them your social media tags where they can reach the gym website or where they can follow you, etc., etc.? Yeah, well, obviously, uh, Bad Company Gym uh, Facebook page, at Bad Company Gym uh, Instagram uh, Richard Smith Bad Company Gym is my own personal one. Um, they're the, all the ones you need, really. The, the website's badcompany.co.uk, so easy Google search and you'll find you'll find Bad Company easily. Andy? And mine for my Insta is Andy Badco and my YouTube channel, it's uh, Andy House and Muay Thai with lots of new training tips and fights and stuff like that going on there as well now. Right, massive thank you to you both for coming on. I uh, a great insight, Richard, because I think a lot of people overlook sometimes what you have done as a coach and your fight career and stuff. So just to get that out there for everyone to know, I think that's going to be uh, massive. Uh, thank you, Andy, as well. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Cheers, guys. No worries, mate. Thank you.